God is awesome. Please, you may be seated. Thank you so much. What a privilege and an honor it is to be here tonight and looking at your beautiful faces. Before I even start, man, I just want to honor Pastor Elsie, Pastor Edgar. You are all privileged. I'll tell you why. You are all privileged. Because the Bible says that we behold like in a mirror, right? And the image that we are beholding, we are be being transformed into that very same image from one level of glory to another. What am I saying? I'm saying you have pastors that you can see they are beholding an excellent God. Because everything that they do smells excellence. And the Bible says this is the excellent way, which is an, a way of love. So I can say that, I can boldly say that these are men and women of God who love you dearly because of the work that they put in everything that they do, including bathrooms. Excellence even in bathrooms to make sure that, man, when you go there, you, the bathrooms are as excellent as you are. <laughs> so thank you so much, uh, Pastor Elsie, Pastor Edgar. Thank you so much for the privilege. Thank you so much for the honor. I don't take it lightly at all. It is a privilege. And women of promise. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody, woman of promise, woman of promise. Man, I'm so excited to be here tonight and to share. I call myself tonight uh, John the Baptist. Because <laughs> I am here making a way for those that are to come. So I'm just going to put some reeds in your heart just to make sure that the word is landing. Because there's a powerhouse that's coming after me, right? I want to make sure, Mama, I'm serving you well. So that when you, by the time you come, at least the reeds, you know the reeds, the risk of disappointment, disillusionment, dis all the disses that you can think of, they'll be out. Amen. They'll be out. So, without wasting time, I would like us to go to Ecclesiastes. So, I said I'm John the Baptist, right? Yeah. I'm John the Baptist, I'm John the Baptist. Be expectant because there's much more that will be coming. Tonight and tomorrow. So, we're saying standing at the door of promise. Standing at the door of promise. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 11, NIV. Ecclesiastes chapter number 9 verse 11, NIV. It says, I have seen, I do apologize. It says, I have seen something else under the sun. That the race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong. Nor does food come to the wise, or wealth to the brilliant, or favor to the learned, but time and chance happens to us all. Man, Pastor Elsie, I want to say this is a scripture that delivered me. When I realized, I, I, when I looked at the scripture, I realized that life is actually fair. Did you grow up knowing that life is not fair? Because you see certain things happening to certain people. And because they were born in a certain household, you think, man, life is not fair. Because if also, if I was also born in a particular family, maybe I'll have certain opportunities. But I realized through the scripture, no, 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 no. Life is fair. Life is fair because it says what? Time and chance happens to them all. Now, I may not know vendor, but I know in vendor, all means all. Right? As much as I'm Kosa, but I know in Kosa, all means? Is it Zote? Zote. Ah, you see, I said I don't know, I repent, I do know. <laughs> it is zote, all is all. In every language, all means all. Meaning lungi is included in that all. Meaning you are included in that all. It says time and chance. I mean, it liberated me because I know I'm not fast. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. So the Bible says that, no, but this race is not for the suit. It's not for the fastest people. I said, what are you talking about? Pastor Elsie, I was like, okay, so I'm also included in this. He said, it's not for the fastest. In fact, in fact, this race is not for the brilliant. It's not looking at your IQ hey. or EQ or AQ. There's so many EQs now. There's IQ, there's EQ, there's AQ, adversity. How do you do it? It's, it's not looking at that. It says time and chance happens to them all. It gave me so much liberty because I know I'm not fast. I cannot run. If you had to compete with me, you, you will beat me. You already win. I'm not going to attempt it. You already win. All right? But it says this race is not about the fastest person. 
It's not about the person who, who grew up in a right home. It's not even about your race. Some of us have left the promises that God has for us because we disqualified ourselves thinking, I'm only a woman. Some of us have left the things that God has promised us because you're thinking, my background. Do you not know that the Bible says you are a new creation in Christ Jesus? It says you are a new creation and it's not talking about a changed life. No, 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 no. It's talking about an exchanged life. You exchanged your life for Christ's life. So whatever it is that you thought was keeping you in the past, it's not an excuse anymore. I said I'm John the Baptist. I said I'm John the Baptist. I'm just here to remove some reeds. There's excuses that we have left that we cannot even enter the things that God has for us. So we're standing at the door of promise. And the door is quite significant. Because the door is talking about something that is behind. And mind you me, there's also something that is before us. So we've established that the thing that is before us is time. It is chance. It says it doesn't matter where you're coming from, but this one thing is guaranteed. You have time to rise. And it says that what? You will have your own chance. Man, it brings so much liberty because all of a sudden I don't have to envy another woman. Because the Bible says time and chance happens to them, including us. So when I see somebody else's chance, I don't envy them because I know that means my chance is coming. I'm just, I'm John the Baptist, I said, right? So the door, we're standing at the door and it's talking about a separation, a transition that is happening. Meaning I'm transitioning from one thing into another. So when you came in, you transitioned from outside into this room. And what was the separator? There was a door. There was a door that you had to enter. Even when you're going out, you have to go out of the door. So it separates you from... And then now you are made alive into something else. We find that in Genesis. It talks about it. The Bible says that um, in Genesis, if you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. If you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. In Genesis, talking to Adam and Eve, if you eat, and this is God, if he says surely, he means what? Yeah, 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 yeah. He means what he says. We've already seen that whatever he says happens. Because he said, let there be and there was. So whatever he says, what? Happens. He said, let there be light and there was. He said, let there be and let there be and let there be and there was. So he says, if you eat, you shall surely die. But here's the thing. I know, I know, I, I know how we are as Christians, right? There are certain things we encounter in the Bible, but it does not make sense. So we use the line, God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> we're like, just leave that one to pastor. But the point is, but because yes, what happens? The same God that said you shall surely die, he says, Adam, where are you? Why are you asking if he's dead? He says, Adam, where are you? He's looking for the people that he said they shall surely die. And here's the one thing that amazed me even more. They responded. <laughs> they said we were naked, so we hid. Even though their, their answer is really location rather than the question that. But the point is they responded, right? We hear them responding. What happened? Did he not say you shall surely die? But he was talking about separation. So life is just, death is a separation. It is a separation. So what happened? When we're saying a person has died, we're saying that their spirit and their soul was separated from this world and this body. So we say they are. But the person that you're talking about and you're saying they died, let me tell you, they once died. They've died before. Can I tell you that you once died? You died before. You were separated before. You were once in your mother's belly. For nine months, that was your world. Have you, have you seen a pregnant person? Or have you been pregnant? We women, right? So for, the, for those who've been pregnant, you, you felt the baby kicking. You know the baby's alive. Leave the world because they don't, know the de- they don't know the definition of life. But you know the baby is alive because the baby is kicking. Sometimes you don't know whether it's soccer that's happening there. But something is happening. And so this baby... To them, the womb is their world. 
The womb is their world. So for nine months, they were comfortable being fed through their mother. And then after nine months, the same child cries. Because what is happening, they think they are dying, but they're being separated from the world that they've once known. But they're being made alive into something much bigger, which is this earth. But wait a minute, the same child, the same child grows up in this world, gets comfortable with this world. Everything about this world, they are successful, they're climbing corporate ladders, they're doing their things, you know. They want to be in, they have the makeup, they're contouring, they're doing everything. You know, they, they're comfortable with this world, they're buying the biggest car, they, they think they're successful. And then the end comes. So that same child who's now grown up is being separated from the world that they've always known. For 70 years, for 60 years, for 80 years, for 100 years, they've known this as their world. They get separated, unknown to them. They're being made alive into something bigger which is heaven. That's why the Bible says that mortality has been swallowed up. Immortality has been swallowed up. It says it's been swallowed up because when you are a Christian, you're already made alive unto God. You were translated from the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light. So you were made alive unto? You've already been separated. So we always say that, you know, people don't fear change, but they fear death. So the thing that is keeping you is because you are fearful of what you are losing. Let me tell you, one of the things as women, it's nice that we are women here, we can talk as women. Because one thing I've never understood, I'm not married, right? But one thing I've never understood, a woman is a makodi. She will complain about the mother-in-law. This mother-in-law is mingling into our business. This mother-in-law is what? I, this mother-in-law, this mother-in-law. And then she has a boy child. And then the boy child grows up. And then she's the mother-in-law. And she's doing the same thing. <laughs> what happened? Now you are the same mother-in-law that you were despising. But here's the thing. We never taught that there's a separation. The Bible says that a child needs to live and cleave. It's talking about a separation. So there's a separation when a boy grows up, they need to separate from their mother. If they don't separate from their mother, and if you as a mother, you don't grieve the loss. The problem is that, the problem is, nobody told you that there is a death that is happening. And you need to acknowledge the death. Your munch munch small anyana boy is not a munch munch anymore. There's a separation that needs to be acknowledged. And it's not something that is taught. But if you understand that and you allow yourself to go through the process of grieving, you will be a good mother-in-law. But I'm not blaming mother-in-laws because what? We were not taught. So you, you've become the same mother-in-law that you once hated. Because you can't let go of your... So there's a separation that is needed. Can I say that there are things that God has for us, but because we don't know how to deal with the transition, we limit ourselves to what God has. Man, the last time that I was here, Nehemiah, well, we opened in Nehemiah, I know it was quick, Nehemiah 2, chapter 17, it says, the city lies in ruins. And I said, man, Centurion is in ruins. Pretoria is in ruins. People are knowing Pretoria for false prophets. And you are here as a believer. The Bible says, arise, shine, for your light has come. It says, arise. And here's an amazing thing. It doesn't say pray to arise. It says, arise. Hello? It doesn't say fast to arise. It says, arise. Hello? It doesn't say form a prayer chain. It says, arise. And then it says shine, but it says darkness shall fill the earth. So when the darkness is filling the earth, it doesn't mean that we're supposed to be shocked because it's already written. But it says, no, 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 it's a setup stage for you. Amen. When you see darkness, the Lord is saying, the reason that you are in Centurion, you are called for such a time as this. You are the promise. You are the promise. You are the Esther of the time. He says, arise, Esther. The Bible 
Bible is talking about the Debras of this world. It says there needs to be Debras that are rising. What am I talking about? I'm not talking about a reincarnation of a Debra. You have the greater than Deborah who is Christ who's on the inside of you. We're talking about the spirit of Deborah, not the spirit that is in you. Oh man, well, you know when you're a Christian, you have to explain a lot of things. A spirit meaning the attitude of a Deborah. It says you need to arise because there's a Christ that is on the inside of you. There's, the Bible talks about the earth that is waiting. It says the earth is groaning. So when you hear at Bree Street that the earth is groaning, you are shocked. But the Bible told you a long time ago that the earth is groaning. When you're hearing that there are people that are being sprayed doom, doom, you are shocked. But the Bible says the earth is groaning. But it says it is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And you are that son of God. And I mean, it's time for us to realize that we are sons. Because sometimes we even get offended when we're saying sons. You're like, okay, sons and daughters. I'm the daughter of the Most High God. And that's good, it's good, it's good. But man, you're a son. The Bible talks about sons of God. Amen. Now, I always say this in Phoenicia. I say that, you know what? I believe. I'm going to shock all of you right now. <laughs> the church I belong to in Cape Town, it did not believe in women ministers. And I said to them, you know what? I also don't believe that women should ever stand behind this pulpit and minister. Oh, no amens, eh? <laughs> I believe that no woman should ever stand behind this pulpit and minister. No. You know, being at college and as a woman, I teach on marriage. And if you see, if you've seen, I'm not married, right? But I am married to Christ. But I also believe that no unmarried person should teach on marriage. And yet I teach on marriage with so much boldness. Ask them. <laughs> because no man, no man, no man is meant to be standing behind this pulpit and minister. No man. But a Christ in a man and a Christ in a woman should stand here and minister with boldness. The Bible says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God. It is the power of God at to salvation. The thing that's going to bring deliverance in your life is the gospel. Yeah. But for a long time as women, we've been shrinking back. We're shrinking back because we're saying, no, well, you know, it's supposed to be men. No, 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 no. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yeah. He says the city is lying in ruins. The city is lying in ruins as there you are as a son of God. We get so excited, Pastor. We get so excited in just coming to church and, and we know a form of godliness, right? We know exactly how to raise our hands and we know how to, hey, Jesus, hey, hey. <laughs> You're like, I feel the power. We know how to even imitate the power. Uh, it's just your favorite song, oh? It's, it, you know, sometimes it's not, not so much of the anointing, it's just, it's your jam. The, the same thing you used to do in the party. You're like, that's my jam. We're doing it in the church. You're like, whoo! You're just doing it differently now. Okay, okay. I, 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 I want my pastor to call me again, so let me behave. The students said they're behaving. It looks like I'm the one who needs to behave. I'm behaving. I'm behaving. I do apologize to all the students that are here. I'm behaving. They're like, don't do the things you do at college, please. Right? It says time and chance happens to us all. Time and chance happens to us, we're standing at the door. In First Chronicles 12 verse 32, in NIV it says, From Issachar, man who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. We need to be people that understand the times. The reason that we're not entering into that which God has for us is because we are oblivious to what the time is. We're not recognizing the time. It's a matter of recognizing. Let me give you an example. There's a powerful woman in John 5. Man, is it John 4? I'm, so, I'm sorry, and I'm a Bible school director. I apologize for the wrong scripture. Man, it says this woman, the Samaritan woman. The story, it amazes me. She is standing with the creator of the entire universe. She goes into a debate. 
She goes into a debate about a woman speaking to a man, all the traditional cultural things of the time. She goes into a debate and the Bible says that she did not recognize who it is that was before her. It's about recognizing the times. Man, I'm so proud of you. I'm going to tell you, please, please continue the way you've been continuing. Eh? The way you honored our mama Pasai, no, Papa. man, you honored them so well. But you know what? Sometimes when you talked about familiarity, it's because people stop to recognize the gift that is on the inside of them. There is a gift that is before you. There's a reason that you are called into this church at such a time as this. But sometimes because they are wonderful, because they are accessible, because they love on you, you stop to recognize the gift. It happens. It happens. I'm telling you, they, you know, sometimes if, you, if you're a white, and they, they'll have more reverence. <laughs> if, if you're a white, there'll be a certain... No, 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 no. It, it talks about us as black people. We have a certain inferiority complex that sometimes we don't know how to honor our own, but we want to honor if they're a different race. Or even more so, if they're coming from a different place. If they come and they have a different accent, right? If they have a different accent, all of a sudden, hey, hey, there's, and yet you don't understand. Man, I have this passion, my pastor. I have a passion that as Africans, we need to learn to own our own because I'm seeing the gift that is locked up in this continent of Africa. Can you recognize the gift that is right here in the city of Centurion? Can you recognize the gift that is here in this country, South Africa? God has brought us a gift. And I'm saying one gift because they want flesh. And sometimes we don't recognize. It says the sons of Issachar, they knew the times. And so sometimes we're not accessing the things because we don't know what the times and the seasons in our life. What season are you in? What is it that God is trying to give you that you're sabotaging yourself in? Because sometimes we get so comfortable in religion. I said religion is complicated. You know what religion does? It says you did not access the promise because you didn't do this and you try and do that. And it says, well, you did that very well, but you need to add a bit of step number two that you left out. When you add number, step number two, it says there's step three. After three, there's four. And religion becomes very complicated. We get comfortable with it though. We get comfortable because at least religion is giving me another thing that I need to do. We get comfortable because it's, me, it's keeping me in my comfort zone. I don't have to infiltrate the city because I'm still busy with step number two. I don't have to infiltrate the city because, well, I'm still, you know, I'm calling on the prayer chain. Come on, somebody. Yeah. We don't have to access and infiltrate the city because we have, we, no, 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 no. I can't be a CEO. Who told you? Who told you that you can't? Let me tell you something. Let me liberate you very quickly. You don't work for the company that you are working for. The problem people don't access the promotion that God has for them is because they're not recognizing the assignment. You are at the place that you are at. Not to, the work is just a byproduct. The Bible says that having eyes, they do not see. So you happy that God has promoted you, but do you understand what the assignment is for? Because let me tell you, it is so easy for God to promote you. Sometimes you're conforming to the patterns of the workplace of corporate where you have to beg, 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 bite and do all of those things that corporate does, right? I was in corporate, I know. You know? So you, have, you, you conform yourself to doing those things because you think this is the only way. It's the only way that you get a promotion. If I don't stay on Friday and drink with everybody and network, it's called, ah, it's like I know the things you do on Friday. <laughs> I need to connect in order. No, 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 no. The Bible says if you understood the assignment, when you are done with the assignment, God opens the door wide open. He says, come through. He separates you from the one season into the other because you've accomplished the assignment that he has given you. Do you, what is the assignment that you are called for? What is the assignment? Not the work, not the work, not the work, not the work. He will give you even divine ideas to finish what the work so that you can focus on the assignment. He will make you look good. Man, I don't even have time for testimonies. Man, God will make you look good. I had a 
privilege of being in a, with executives presenting at the age of 27. Because what? He says, I'll open the doors for you. Why? Because you are finishing the assignment. And when the assignment was accomplished, he said, I need you to leave this place and go to Bible college. The reason that people, I'm so sorry, I don't want to use this as an air term for the Bible college, but the reason that people don't even go to Bible college is because they're thinking it's for full-time ministry. Do you know corporate is a jungle? You need Bible college more than a pastor. Corporate is not easy. Corporate, you need to be, you, you need to be established in your identity in Christ to survive that world. He says they did not access because they did not know the times. They could not recognize the times and the seasons of their life. What season, what is it that God has for you? He says you are at a time of transition. It's not by mistake that you are here tonight because there's a transition that you are going through. You are being separated from something into something, but he says you are blocking me. It's like God is trying to nudge you into something, but you are sabotaging yourself. You're pulling yourself back because of excuses. So there are many things, and I'm going to be quick with this, there are many things that keep us from accessing what God has. There are many things. Sometimes it's loss of hope. In Luke 24, verse 15 to 16 in the NIV, it talks about the disciples. It says, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. The disciples, he spent three years with them. And it says that when he came and he, and he came back, he, after, he resur- he, no, after he came back and then he was walking with them, he says, the Bible says that they were kept from recognizing him. So the question, what was it that kept them from recognizing the same Jesus that they walked with for three years? And if you read the scripture further, okay, let's read it. From verse 13, it says, Now that same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Mind you me, they were <laughs> so they were talking about current affairs, eh? They're like, do you know what happened? So they were well informed. They knew TikTok or the TikTok of the time. <laughs> They were well informed. They were discussing about the things that were happening. It says they were talking about everything that had happened. In 15, it says, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. 17, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? He, He spoke with them. They were hearing, but they were not hearing. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So the second hearing. So as much as they were hearing, but they were kept from hearing what was going to be their breakthrough, there was no faith. 17, it says, they stood still. Okay. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. There's the clue. Their faces downcast, meaning that they had lost hope. They were disappointed. They were expecting something that did not happen the way that they expected it to happen. Is there something that you were expecting from Jesus? I'm going to talk about things that we don't want to talk about at church. Let me tell you, truth is not afraid to be questioned. Sometimes we leave certain things, we don't want to deal with the disappointments of our hearts because we think, oh no, God works and we just push it on the side. But you know what that does? It hardens your heart because you know that, man, I believed you, God. I fasted, God. I prayed. I did all the things that I thought I meant to be doing. It did not happen. I came to church, I was excited because when the word was shared, I knew this is my word. We said double grace, right? We said you receive the double grace, but then you don't go back after a year or two like, what happened? I've heard people testifying, but I have no testimony. 
the Bible in Hebrews, when it talks about the giants of faith, it talks about Sarah and it says, Sarah judged God faithful. If you can judge God to be faithful, it means that you can judge God to be unfaithful. It's a thing that we don't want to talk about, but there are things, it's keeping you from recognizing what he has for you because at some point in your life, Lord, I've been praying for a child. Lord, I've been confessing scriptures. My heart is hardened. I'm disappointed. I have judged God to be faithful, but I can't even go to God because I feel like if I have to even tell the pastor that I feel God has failed me. I can't even tell my sister that I've been praying with that I feel like God has failed me. So what are we left with? The form of godliness. But we deny the power thereof. Because all we do is like, I'm blessed. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm here. I'm attending. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, I'm serving. Hallelujah, I'm doing all the things that I'm meant to be doing as a Christian. The Bible says they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Is it possible that serving you are serving, but your heart is far from God? Is it possible that you're doing the things right and everybody can say, Hallelujah, praise God, we love sister so-and-so, but sister so-and-so's heart is far from God. God will rather you even stop serving. He says, come, I want to dine with you. He says, I want to change your heart from a heart of stone. You, you, you are insensitive to even my presence because of the disappointment. He says, they walked with God, but they were kept from recognizing him. We think somebody kept them. No, 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 no. They walked with Jesus, but they were kept because of their disappointment. What things were you trusting God for? I said, I'm pulling the reeds. I'm just John the Baptist, right? I just want to pull the reeds because there's disappointment. It doesn't matter. You, I know you have a powerful word, my mother, but it won't even land because of disappointment. There's powerful speakers lined up for you tomorrow, but it won't even land because of? What, what, what is it that has been keeping you from God? It says their faces were down, downcast, right? Let's move quickly. In John 4, talking about the Samaritan woman, she's discussing, I spoke about her, she's discussing about gender issues and religious issues. You're a Samaritan, I'm a, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, and we're not supposed to be talking all of that. It was the traditions of man that kept her from recognizing. There are philosophies, there are traditions of man that are keeping you from accessing the things that God has for you. What am I saying? I spoke about it. I said, God, I want you to be a CEO, God says. But you say, but I can't be a CEO because in my family there are no CEOs. We're fighting with an imposter syndrome because it's like somebody's going to figure out that I, I'm not even qualified for this job. We forget that God uses the foolish things of this world. The CV has not changed. If you want to be used by God, God uses foolish things. So you qualify. The problem that God cannot use you is because you're looking at your own qualification, your own wisdom, your own degrees, your own whatever. Let me tell you, you can have so many degrees, but the degrees are doing nothing. The CV has not changed. He uses the base things of this world. You're saying, Lord, but I'm only a woman. Moses said the same thing, gave excuses, said, I can't even speak. It was a lie. He went to the best of schools. Moses, he went to the best of schools. He could speak. He was articulate. But the desert dealt with him very nicely. <laughs> and he says, I can't even speak. But it was a lie. And when God, when, when you're saying you can't even speak, he says, no, 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 that's why I chose you. I know the things that you, do, you, you don't have. Lord, I'm not even married. Let me tell you, I'm not standing here saying things that I'm saying this because I went through it myself. I told you that I was in corporate for 10 years and I led um, a team just with men. 
I was in the IT, I know it's banking, but in the IT side, man, and I went into boardrooms where it was all men and all white and all old. <laughs> Do you understand? There's people like you just nodding, you know. You know, Hashem, you have to work hard, eh? You, work, you have to work twice as much just to prove that you're supposed to be in that room. I would go with a guy that is in my team that I'm training, a trainee. Because he's white and he's male, they'll look to him for answers for my team. And he would look to me and I give him the answer so he can give the man. <laughs> but I'm telling you that because when I went into ministry, I said, hey, Jesus, deliverance has happened. I don't have to prove myself. Unknown to me, pastor, unknown to me that when I got to corporate, when I got into ministry, then there's something else that was awaiting me. I'm not married. I'm not married. And mind you me, nobody said this to me. I felt it. It was a philosophy that was in my heart. It was a stronghold that was keeping me from accessing the things that God has because I thought, if only I get married. They say you mustn't do these things without a covering. <laughs> Which is a man. So I'm like, oh Lord, a man, a man, a man. A man, a man. Just bring anyone. A <laughs> man. Just, just, you know the things that I used to wish for? I used to wish for... You know when you know you know when the uh, <laughs> you know when the couple comes and then they 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 just before they preach the men of God before they preach they're like I just I just want you to greet my wife <laughs> no, no 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 just stand I want that to be that one <laughs> hello church. But I'm telling you, it was a stronghold. Nobody, nobody, nobody had an issue with me being single. Trust me. Nobody in the ministry has an issue with that. But for me, I felt like something was missing. I felt like the women are protected. There's somebody's backing them up. Even the scripture says two is better than one. <laughs> it says there's a synergy. I said, Lord, I'm only chasing a thousand. Can you bring him so we can chase 10,000 together? Come on, somebody. And then, and then you, know, you know, the word of God is powerful. The, the Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth that you know will set you free. So deliverance is by the word of God. So God had to deliver me from that stronghold and he took me to Hebrews 13. He says, let your lives be free from covetousness. Be content with what you have. And I also misread that scripture because when it says be content with what you have, I thought it meant that I need to be content with my smaller nyana car and my smaller nyana house and my smaller nyana. And it has to be smaller nyana for you to be content, right? You can't be content with your big house. You must be small, smaller nyana. So I was like, man, this scripture, I need to be content with my smaller nyana singleness and my smaller nyana, everything I must be content with. But that's not what the scripture is says. It says... For he himself has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He says, be content with me. You have me. He says, be content with me. He says, Lungi, I'm your husband. If you have the creator of the entire universe as your husband, when he introduced you, now I'm like, Hi. Because I'm being introduced. Man, what a beautiful intro. Thank you so much, man. I was, man, I'm like, as you speak, I'm like, there's my hubby. There's my hubby. That's my hubby. <laughs> when, he, when he introduces, you get what I mean? He says, be content with what you have. You have me. He says, what can mere mortals do to you? You have me. So be content with the fact that you have God. Whichever door he opens for you, it's him who's ushering you into it. He's a gentleman. So there are strongholds in our hearts that are keeping us. Be it our family background. You know, I grew up in rural areas. I can't even speak. You know, people now, you know, you know these young ones, the way they speak their English, it's not only coming out from their nose. It's always coming. It's even coming from their ears. And so you think, but I, I don't qualify because, you know, I, the world is needing people that have English that's coming out from all sides. But the, Bible, but the Lord is saying, be content with the fact that you have me. 
So I don't know about you. What, what are the strongholds? What are the philosophies that have been keeping you? The Bible says that in, in, in Psalms 45, it says, it says, my heart is, is overflowing with a good thing. Now, when it says my heart is overflowing with a good thing, it means that your heart could be overflowing with a bad thing. And the word theme is, talks about a melody. It says it's a recurring melody. It says, an, another definition of theme, it says it's a thesis. So the question is, what is the thesis of your life? What is the subject of that thesis? Because you're living it out every time. God cannot even take you to the places that he has for you because the thesis is speaking. It says, I'm a failure. It says, I'm a failure, even though he has good things for you. So we can sit here and talk about the good things that he has for you. But the problem is, even with those good things, you can't access them because the theme is speaking louder. It says, I'm a failure. It says, I don't, I'm not educated. God is not looking at your education. He says, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest. I I will raise up for myself self, a faithful priest that will do that which is according to my heart and my mind. He's looking for people that will allow him to make into faithful priests that do that which is in his heart and his mind. And he says, if you allow yourself to yield your heart to my heart so that my heart beat and your heart beat are in sync, he says, you are usable. He says, now you are usable. He can open any doors just because he knows I can trust you. What is the theme of your heart? What is the theme of your heart? Is it, is it maybe that there is a theme that is, that is fear? Disappointment. Loss of hope. The Bible says um, hope deferred makes the heart you lost hope, so you have a sick heart. A sick heart cannot receive anything from God. You have philosophies that are keeping you. The Bible says a double-minded man receives nothing from God. You have two minds. There's one that says, yes, the promises of God are yes and amen, but there's another man that says, not for me, because I've seen him disappoint me before. I'm inviting you and maybe if we can close our eyes and just allow God. David says, search my heart, oh God. See if there's any wicked way. And it's a wicked way of unbelief. There are things that have hardened your heart so much. There are things that you don't even want to talk to anybody about. Because you're like, God, where were you when I was evicted? Where were you when I was raped? Where were you when I was abused by that man for so many years? I prayed, I cried, Lord, where were you? Where were you when I was crying for my child to be saved from drug addiction? Where were you? And God is responding. He's responding this evening and he says, my daughter, I've always been there. He says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. And with loving kindness, I have drawn you to myself. He says, if you can trust me again, if you can give me another chance again, if you can give me another chance to prove myself to you. He says, I've been waiting for so long because your heart has been far from me. He says, if you knew the plans and the thoughts that I have for you, there are plans to prosper you and not to harm you, not to harm you. But if you invite me into that space of disappointment, I can bring truth into it. There's a lie that you have believed about me. And the lie that you have believed about me is keeping you from me. It's keeping you from the things that I have for you. I'm a God of restoration. I can restore your family. I'm a God of restoration. I can restore your womb. Maybe it's because you think you had an abortion and that's why you cannot have a child anymore. I want to tell you this evening, my daughter, that I am a God of restoration. I'm a God who speaks to things and they come alive. And right now we speak to those dead bones. We speak into those womb right now. We say womb, be fruitful in the name of Jesus. 
Wombo, be fruitful. Hear the word of the Lord. Submit yourself to the word of the Lord. Womb, be fruitful. We're speaking to those hearts. And God says, man, I'm not, a, I'm not afraid of your disappointments. I'm not afraid of your insecurities. All I want is for you to understand that I have set the table before you in the presence of your insecurities, in the presence of your disappointments, in, your, in the presence of your disillusionment, in the presence of all the things that have been keeping you from me. I'm saying invite me in despite those things. Father, we thank you for the hearts that are in this place. Lord, we speak into those hearts right now. We uproot every lie. Every lie. We speak healing right now. Hearts be made whole. In the name of Jesus, hearts be made whole. Let the king of glory come in. Let the king of glory come in. We say arise Jehovah in our hearts and let your enemies be scattered. Let disappointment be scattered. Let depression be scattered. Arise Jehovah. Be our stronghold. We are choosing to return to you. We choose to be prisoners of hope. Father, we give you all the praise, Daddy for every heart that you are restoring in this place. In the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Thank you so much.